This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. I'm Professor Cuttykins. I'm a weird statue of Scott Bakula. I am Batman! And I'm the human avatar of the feeling of social anxiety made flesh. All those stories and the mummified corpse of Andy Rooney tonight on 69 Minutes. If you're someone like me who spends most of the time on YouTube watching amazing two hour long videos on why the Matrix sequels are awesome, you might be surprised to learn that 60 Minutes, that TV show that your grandmother used to put on between stirring the pasta pot for dinner and whacking your hand with a wooden spoon for trying to steal some cookies from the cookie jar, thereby causing you to have a distinct guttural reaction associated with the sound of a ticking clock, is actually still a show that people still watch on television. Was that oddly specific? That was oddly specific. Anyways, yes, 60 Minutes is indeed a TV show that, despite your father falling asleep to it in the armchair every single night, is still a TV show that people watch on television today. And it recently ran a segment about transgender healthcare, which was sparked mainly by the rush of anti-transgender laws both here in the United States, where I am, and the United Kingdom. Yet, while the segment, which was produced and reported on by Leslie Stahl, claimed to be trying to address the concerns and issues facing a deeply marginalized group, what it did instead was reinforce dangerous stereotypes and narratives about the trans community, especially related to our healthcare. So, for today's video, and because I'm currently trapped in this 60 minutes void and unable to escape, please send me help in this endless nothingness because I'm surrounded by just giant floating books and there's nothing else but the sound of the ticking stopwatch and I just went out of here, I figured we'd take a look at this segment and break down the issues with it. Mostly because I do think the segment tries to be affirming to transgender people overall, but quickly falls into a terribly manipulative and misinformed narrative that directly harms the transgender community. Something that even the creators of the segment were warned about and did anyways. And the reason I want to focus on this video is not because I want to dunk on 60 minutes, but because one, I want to use this opportunity to educate further about issues facing trans folks in our healthcare, and two, considering that 60 minutes is still one of the top rated news shows on television, it's important to discuss how certain harmful ideas and narratives about the transgender community have started to become more mainstream. Also, seriously, does anyone know a way out of this void? I can't, I can't handle the ticking noise anymore. Please don't bring back the ticking noise. And now, a word from 69 Minute Sponsors. Hey there everybody, it's Jesse in the real world, not that weird crazy void, to thank Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Atlas VPN is a tool that encrypts your data and hides your virtual location. To put it in simpler non-computer geek terms, using Atlas VPN allows you to stay safe and private on the internet. Cause y'all know Jesse likes her private time on the internet. Am I, am I doing that right? Is that the sexy, am I doing the sexy eyebrow move? But seriously, Atlas VPN is offering an awesome discount on a three year subscription, and you can find the link down below in the description, which, if you use, helps me out too. Atlas VPN also has a data breach monitor feature, where if you insert your email address, it scans the internet to see if your email and information has ended up on any data breaches or data dumps with things like your passwords, your name, or other sensitive information, and it keeps you notified if it happens in the future. But my favorite thing about Atlas VPN is that many of you know that I love to watch Star Trek Discovery, but sadly here in the United States, it's only available on Paramount Plus. But if you use Atlas VPN to connect to another country, say the United Kingdom, where it's available on Netflix, boom, you can cruise right on into that Star Trek utopia easy peasy. Atlas VPN is supported on any device and they provide a 30 day money back guarantee on subscriptions and there's an 86% discount, just $139 a month on a three year deal on that link below. So go check it out. But beyond all of that, thank you so much for watching and back to the video. And now back to 69 minutes. <laughs> 69. The 60 minutes segment begins well enough, focusing in on the recent rash of anti-trans legislation facing the transgender community, specifically honing in on the recently passed bill in Arkansas that banned gender affirming care for trans youth. As part of a new culture war, similar bills have been introduced in at least 20 other states. In some cases, doctors could go to jail. Many physicians and therapists are appalled like Erica Anderson, a highly respected gender psychologist at the University of California, San Francisco, who's transgender herself. It's a very ominous development. 
it's a bad sign. As they state, the recent rash of anti-transgender legislation is perhaps the most directly damaging issue facing the trans community in the United States today. There have been around 117 anti-transgender bills introduced across the United States in 2021 alone, ranging from anti-bathroom legislation that we've seen in years prior to trans people being in sports, both of which I've done videos on for both of those ideas. And specifically for this segment, 20 states in the United States have put forth legislation that bans trans-affirming health care for minors, one that would prohibit health care professionals from giving said health care to people under the age of 18. For example, under the law in Arkansas, which as of the writing of this video is the only law to pass state legislators so far, it makes it a felony for a doctor to give trans-affirming care to a minor. The arguments for these bills basically state that trans-affirming health care is experimental and even abusive. While I've spoken about this argumentation in a few other videos, which I highly recommend, the basic idea is that trans-affirming health care is done without, quote, informed consent, and is quickly given to trans youth and is totally irreversible. As if doctors are just quickly trying to push trans youth to get surgery and get irreversible treatments before they're ready for it and before they're able to give informed consent. At least that's the concept and argument that people pushing these bills are making. However, this is far from what actually happens in reality in most cases. In pretty much every single case that we're talking about when it comes to trans minors, the main medical treatment that they're being given is puberty blocking drugs. Some drugs that will allow them to pause the onset of their puberty, which by the way, would create irreversible changes in their body that may cause them depression, anxiety, or even suicidal thoughts if they have to go through it, considering that that's what many trans people go through when they feel like their body is changing at a young age against something that they feel like they fit better in, in their body. These puberty blocking drugs just give trans youth time to decide if they want to go through their normal puberty later in life or take hormones to go through a different puberty than they would normally. Puberty blocking drugs are a reversible decision where you just stop taking them and you will have your normal puberty or you start taking hormones aligned with whatever gender you wish to present as. And this decision is often made after weeks and months of discussion with parents and the child about the ramifications of the decision. Good to see you again. I'm gonna go over all the stuff about the medication. You know, you want it to be kind of slow and steady so you can adjust, transitioning's a big deal. And, but if at any point you feel like this wasn't right, just say so. A 2020 study by the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as a similar study by the Williams Institute at Cornell University, found that given access to these treatments, trans youth showed consistently lower rates of long-term and consistent depression and suicidal thoughts. And these drugs, by the way, are also given to non-trans youth for other issues, such as early onset puberty or those with idiopathic short stature. So these drugs are considered safe for use, unless they're given to trans people, in which case they're considered dangerous and harmful by people arguing for these anti-transgender legislation bills. And as I spoke about in my other video, there's been a lot of fear mongering about these puberty blocking drugs, but they have been clinically proven to be safe for trans kids, including the fact that people who go on them, regardless of if they're trans or not, will not lose their fertility. There's been a lot of evidence to show that. But a lot of groups try to push this narrative that going on puberty blocking drugs will make your kids infertile. This is patently untrue, and by the way, also telling children that they must choose between possibly having the kids someday down the line and actually living as their true selves, or at least having the chance to explore that, is a traumatizing choice to present to any child who's just figuring themselves out. And as a result, these fear-mongering tactics can not only just be misguided, but harmful to kids. Additionally, as I've spoken about in other videos, these bills, including the other anti-transgender bills across the country that focus on sports or bathroom laws, are often not being introduced out of a deep concern for children or the trans community, considering how often they actually ignore real science or the issues at hand. For example, even beyond the trans healthcare bills, when asked about their anti-trans women in student sports bills, few Republicans could identify a case of trans people in youth sports being an issue within their state. Can you name one example of a transgender child trying to gain an unfair competitive advantage at a school there in West Virginia? Well, well, Stephanie, I, I don't have that experience exactly to myself right now, but I will tell Not you yourself, this. your state, I, sir. Can you give me one example of a transgender child trying to get an unfair advantage? Just one in your state. You signed a bill about it. No, I, I can't really tell you one. Often only citing a single case of two trans women in 2017 in Connecticut that made national news as an example of why they think trans women in sports is a problem. A case in which, by the way, the trans women were beaten by the very cisgender girls a few times that claimed that they were consistently losing to these trans teens who had a, quote, distinct physical advantage over them. Again, I've talked about all of this in another video that I highly recommend. 
But to get to the point, these bills are often created by capital R Republican legislations in order to demonize the transgender community to help win votes for them in upcoming elections. Saying ignore the issues of minimum wage or US infrastructure, it's the transes you really need to worry about, so vote for us to stop the horrible, horrible transes and the Democrats from hurting your poor children. As former Trump White House aide and conservative Stephen Miller stated, quote, this issue will help the GOP win midterms. Now, I give you all of this information, by the way, because none of this is anywhere in the 60 Minutes segment. 60 Minutes spends less than two minutes of their 14 minute segment on this issue, basically just saying Arkansas law equal bad, which, you know, is okay, but it never dives that much into any of the reasoning as I've outlined just now, never informing its audience as to why this law is bad and why laws like this are misinformed at best and deceitful manipulation and fear-mongering about a marginalized community at worst. Instead, the segment takes a distinct shift, starting to discuss how quickly transgender healthcare has grown in the last few years. Is there any medical rationale for this legislation, in your opinion? No, there is not. The field of transgender health care has grown rapidly. In 2007, there was one major youth gender clinic in the entire country. Today, there are at least 50. So the segment begins its further analysis of transgender health care issues with the framing that trans health care is quickly expanding and may not fully be completely understood, and then proceeds to explain how the guidelines of care surrounding the trans community are still evolving today. And to be fair, every piece of information that they present here is accurate and true, yet it's only really scratching the surface and not giving a full picture. The WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, offers standards of care for trans youth as they have for many, many years now. And while this standard of care isn't binding for any healthcare professionals, it's the standard that most medical professionals turn to when dealing with trans youth. And it does outline very specific ideas for healthcare for trans people. For example, for genital surgery such as vaginoplasty, trans individuals must have been on hormone therapy and or living publicly in some form as their gender for 12 months if it's safe for them. And this would give a trans individual as well as anyone treating them an idea about how they feel about presenting in the world as their gender. And this is one of the requirements that the 60 minute segment fails to mention, and said framing surgery is only needing a single consent form. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH, issues guidelines that currently say to get medical treatments like hormones or surgery, those under 18 should have parental consent and have seen a therapist. To get hormones, those over 18 can sign an informed consent form after an initial assessment. But for surgery, they too need to have seen a therapist. And this ignores that the WPATH requests two referrals from accredited therapists in order to get said surgeries, as well as the trans individual having well-documented gender dysphoria and being of the age of consent for surgery in their country and giving informed consent for treatment. It also ignores the fact that some people seek out these surgeries for gender euphoria instead of gender dysphoria. And that's something that's a problem with the WPATH itself. Again, something that the 60 minute segment doesn't even mention. Gender euphoria being the idea that someone is happy that they're affirmed in their gender as opposed to feeling depression or anxiety when they're not fitting into the gender that they're told to be assigned at from birth. There's a distinct difference between the two, but we only usually focus on the dysphoria part of the equation of being transgender, when euphoria or even just indifference but just wanting to present as a certain gender are also part of the trans experience as well. Yet, in the segment, this is how 60 Minutes chooses to discuss these guidelines. Is there an accreditation to work in this field? So there is coming to be, yes. The but not yet. Dr. Anderson, who sits on the board of WPATH, says that their guidelines are not always followed by clinicians who are not well trained. Yeah, you saw that right. As soon as this actual doctor starts talking about the accreditation for trans health care, Leslie Stahl literally cuts her off and changes direction. So not only do we get misinformation about the WPATH, but we literally just don't get told anything about the accreditation process or what's it like. Instead, we take a very hard left turn into a very vague discussion about doctors that potentially give out trans-related surgeries very quickly because trans people are unicorns. There are healthcare providers who have jumped into this area because trans people are interesting, you know, they're unicorns, you know, oh, I have one of them now. And I think it's deplorable. Now, no data is cited by how many of these doctors are actually doing this or how many are just giving out trans surgeries like candy, apparently. But I'll give you a little bit of information really briefly right here. Firstly, the WPATH are the guidelines that pretty much almost every single trans-affirming physician uses in the United States. 
I can tell you this from personal experience, but also through research, that of the few health insurances that do cover trans-affirming healthcare, almost every single one of them requires WPATH guidelines to be met before they'll approve of surgery, if they will approve of it at all. Because literally any excuse health insurances can take to not approve of an expensive surgery, they will take it. That's how health insurances in the United States sadly work. They work on denying you the health care that you probably need. Yay capitalism. Isn't it great? And again, that's the health insurances that do recognize the importance of trans-affirming health care. Because many don't, and many won't cover any trans-affirming care at all. For example, a 2015 study by the National Center for Transgender Equality found that 55% of transgender people were denied coverage for surgery within the past year. And considering how expensive most trans-related healthcare is, the only way that trans people are often able to get access to trans-affirming care is through health insurance. As NPR pointed out, hormone therapy, which around 75% of transgender people seek, starts at $20 to $80 a month and is usually taken for the duration of a person's life after transition. Surgeries range widely in type and cost anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000 each. Not to mention the therapy costs that most people need in order to get the referrals for these hormones and surgeries. That survey that I mentioned a few minutes ago also pointed out that 33% of transgender people did not see health providers due to cost in 2014, a percentage that was higher in many marginalized communities like the black community, the Latina community, and many other communities as well. So for many trans people who are often struggling financially because of discrimination against us in employment and many other areas, our healthcare can be out of reach financially for all of us if we don't have it covered by health insurances, which again, typically almost always follow WPATH guidelines. And again, also most physicians follow this too if they're trying to be ethical doctors, because you know, doctors try to like to be ethical. Can some trans people and doctors get around this, especially if they have the money to do so? Yes, but it is typically not the norm for most trans people. Not all of us are Caitlyn Jenner who can just use our family fortunes in order to buy all the trans-affirming healthcare that we need without having to worry about going through the health insurance system. But 60 Minutes doesn't really ever focus on any of these specific issues that trans people face when talking about our healthcare. In fact, the only real line given in that direction is this one. The process today is much easier than it used to be when patients who wanted to transition had to go through extensive therapy that many considered onerous and insulting. In some cases, doctors even tried to, quote, cure them. Cool. A single line briefly mentions the harmful practice of therapists trying to de-gay trans people, which, by the way, is a widespread issue with many trans folks not being believed or understood by their therapists. And this is still a problem today, considering we're still fighting for conversion therapy bans in many parts of the United States and the world. Though the 60 Minutes segment frames it as a thing of the past. It's all gone now, we don't have to worry about it. So already, within this, we see how the 60 Minutes segment is starting to frame trans healthcare as something quickly and more easily accessibly given than it actually is. Yes, all their information is technically true, but they're leaving out large chunks of information to make it seem like trans healthcare is just quickly given out to anyone who wants it. It's starting to frame this idea that, oh my god, trans healthcare is moving so quickly and it's so easy to get this, we can just get it like candy! Keep that framing in mind because we will be coming back to that as an idea. However, giving them credit, the next part of the 60 minute segment, I will say, is at least a good one conceptually, where it focuses in on how trans affirming healthcare can be life saving and helpful for trans individuals. Is your life better? My quality of life has improved drastically. I very much believe if I hadn't done all of these things, there's a high likelihood I would have tried to, to take my own life and I might have succeeded. It's clear that uh, there are many trans children who are helped by the kinds of interventions that we're talking about here that, are, that would be prohibited by these laws. And this is actually great! As I said before, getting trans-affirming healthcare for trans folks of all ages, not just youth, can be life-saving. For one singular example of numerous, the APA in 2019 found a 70% decrease in depression in trans folks who had been given affirming healthcare. In addition, numerous healthcare organizations have all come out in support of giving trans-affirming healthcare. And you know, just for funsies, let me just name a few of these organizations. American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Medical Association, American Counseling Association, American Public Health Association, American School Counselor Association, American School Health Association, American Public Health America, 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 American Public Health America. Yeah, just, just a few. You know, just some of the biggest and most respected healthcare and adjacent organizations in the U.S. So, you know, whatever. But here's where we're starting to get into some real issues because you see, 
Everything that I've discussed so far in this video that has probably totaled up to about 10 minutes of runtime for just this video was literally only four minutes of the 60 minute segment. Four minutes of a 13 minute piece. The trans person in their segment who spoke about how getting trans affirming healthcare can save his life gets about two lines of a sound bite in this video. But do you wanna know what the segment then spends the next eight minutes, literally three fourths of its runtime on? The story of detransitioners, those who begin trans affirming healthcare treatments, but then decide it's not something that they want or fits them. While the vast majority of transgender youth and adults are satisfied with their transitions, not all are. In some cases, patients are choosing to reverse the process. It's called detransitioning. Now, 60 Minutes mainly frames this whole segment on detransitioners on an interview with Grace Ladinsky smith one of these detransitioners. But I want to talk about her a little bit later. So instead, let's first focus on this part of the 60 Minutes interview, where Leslie Stahl interviews four detransitioners in her cool Matrix TV room. In this segment, Leslie asks the detransitioners about their experience and how horrific and harmful and painful it was for them. Garrett from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, went from taking hormones to getting his testicles removed, he says in just three months, whereas the current guidelines call for continuous use for a year. I had never really been suicidal before um, until I had my breast augmentation. And about a week afterwards, I wanted to like actually kill myself. Now, as this clip shows, the stories of detransitioners can be quite hard to listen to you hear how these folks were rushed through their trans healthcare practices. The segment focuses on how these detransitioners were not given the right tools or amount of time to fully understand why they were feeling wrong about their bodies and latched onto transgender transition as the answer without having the time to fully explore that with a therapist. And all of that sounds really horrible. And I'm not gonna lie, it is something that does happen. Especially because as I said, the WPATH guidelines are just that guidelines and not specific rules that any specific healthcare provider has to follow. Detransition does happen and it is incredibly difficult for those who go through it and they have my every sympathy. It is something that we should talk about because it is a problem. However, there are a few things when talking about detransitioners that the 60 minute segment leaves out. The ability to go from just learning about transition to full-blown surgery is insanely atypical for most trans people. Firstly, again, most surgeons require that you follow the one year on hormones guideline that the WPATH puts out. Not to mention that you also need two referrals from therapists, which also takes time and money to get. Time and money or health insurance that most trans folks who are often discriminated against being hired for higher income employment don't have. Additionally, a study found that the average wait time for surgeries for trans people is, at the shortest, 212 days for genital surgeries like vaginoplasty, almost a full year, to at the longest, 607 days for facial feminization surgery. That's almost two years. So between one and two years for any type of trans affirming surgeries is the norm. I can personally attest to this. My vaginoplasty, from consultation to surgery, not counting the therapy, not counting going through health insurance or anything like that, just consultation to surgery, took basically a full year for me to go through. And currently, I literally had my first facial feminization surgery consultation in 2018. And it looks like that I still may not be able to get my FFS until early 2022, though my surgery still, right now, isn't scheduled. In the United Kingdom, which forces trans folks to go to severely understaffed and limited gender clinics around the country, wait times can last up to half a decade and change for surgeries. All of this effectively denies trans folks healthcare for long periods of time, during which they still face mental health struggles, depression and discrimination and suicidal thought ideation due to the fact that they aren't being given trans affirming healthcare in a timely manner. And all of this, by the way, are real healthcare challenges to trans healthcare that the 60 minute segment never even mentions. On top of all of this, detransitioners make up an insanely small percentage of the trans population. In the United States, there are estimated to be 1.4 million transgender people. In 2015, a survey by the National Center for Transgender Equality found that only 8% of trans folks reported detransitioning. And of that 8%, 62% said they only detransitioned temporarily due to cost issues or discrimination that they faced in the workplace or in public. 
Literally only 0.4% of respondents that said that they detransitioned did so because they thought transition wasn't right for them. 0.4%. Similarly, a 2018 study in the Netherlands found that only 1.9% of adolescents who started puberty blockers didn't go on to start actual transition. Beyond that, a 50-year-long Swedish study published in 2010 found that only 2% of folks regretted transitioning. 2%. So at most, at most, 2% of trans people, and I stressed at most, face detransitioning. This compared with the 17% of people who get cosmetic plastic surgeries and regret it. Literally, detransitioning is less of an issue than those who regret cosmetic surgeries as a whole, something that never causes us to stop and limit the number of plastic surgeries happening around the world or try to legislate the number of plastic surgeries happening around the world. And by the way, I, a single YouTuber by myself, found all of this information that I just gave to you in about mm, 30 minutes of Googling. 30 minutes of Googling to find all that information. It was pretty easy to find. But 60 Minutes, a actual professional organization, cites none of this information. Do you know what 60 Minutes cites as evidence of the smallness of the detransitioner community? Though their percentage among the more than 1.4 million transgender Americans is assumed to be small. They are becoming more public though. We found a Reddit detransition support group with over 19,000 members worldwide. They cite a fucking subreddit. A subreddit which almost for sure is not made up of only detransitioners. Considering how much the detransitioner narrative, which I'll be getting into this in just a second, is weaponized against the trans community, my bet is that community is probably made up of mostly not even detransitioners. Yet that's the information that they cite to, as their like proof that detransitioners are a small part of the trans community, which by the way, is a good thing that they are citing that. But to cite a fucking subreddit, a fucking subreddit, it blows my mind. You're actual journalists. You are paid to do this. I'm just a dork here in front of a green screen on the internet. You're journalists. You get paid to do this and you can't even do the 30 minutes of Googling. You just do the same amount of information searching that I do and lying in my bed in my pajamas at night by just scrolling through subreddits. You're journalists. You're journalists. Do the work. Do the work. It's not that hard. Ah! Also, if you acknowledge that this is such a small issue for the trans community in your own reporting, why are you spending three-fourths of your video on this topic? Just thought I'd re-mention that, because it's bonkers to me. This just proves to me how little they gave a crap when it came to actually researching this segment. But okay, I don't want to seem like an asshole or seem callous here. I did a whole video on this. But detransitioning, like I said, is a problem, and people do get hurt when they detransition. It is a small problem of at most, at most, 2% of folks who get gender-affirming care. But I don't want this to happen to anybody. Yet by framing that as the biggest point, it starts to make this idea that, oh my gosh, the detransition population is a reason that we should try to pull back on trans health care, to try not to do as much for trans affirming care because it might hurt us, it might create this detransitioner problem, which is such a small, small problem when compared to the larger problem of trans people needing to get gender affirming care and how important it is for trans people to get gender affirming care. But by focusing on the not at all proportional problem of detransitioners, the segment falls into the exact narrative that numerous anti-trans groups use to try to deny trans folks healthcare and demonize the trans community. For example, I already did a whole video on this book right here, Ir Irreversible, Irreversible, Irreversible Damage, Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters by Abigail Streeter. Anyways, sorry, Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters by Abigail Schreer. There, I said it in a nice way. Ugh, it's probably the nicest thing I'm going to say about this book because this book has become a bestseller and been sold everywhere from Amazon to Target, despite repeated pushes for it to be taken down as hate speech, which it is against the transgender community. And Schreier herself has been platformed by some of the biggest shows around the United States and the UK, including Joe Rogan, Ben Shapiro, and more. While I recommend my other video where I did a whole segment on this book, as well as the wonderful videos by YouTuber Cass Eris, who points out all the bunk science that this book uses, 
In brief, Schreer, in this book, weaponizes these detransitioner stories and debunks science to argue that trans people are trying to seduce young girls into transitioning, irrevocably harming them. The dangers are legion, the safeguards absent. Perhaps the greatest risk of all for adolescent girls who grasp at this transgender identity out of the blue like it is the inflatable ring she hopes will save her will wake up one morning with no breasts and no uterus and think I was only 16 at the time. A kid. Why didn't anyone stop me? She frames these detransitioners in order to demonize and harm the transgender community, saying that trans healthcare has gone too far, that it's gone too quickly, that it's really, really hurting the poor, poor children. I think in America we have a weakness for anything that gets cloaked in civil rights, and part of that is very noble and good. Obviously, the civil rights movement was extremely important in our country and 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 extremely, you know, valuable. Um, and valorous, but but now anything that gets called a civil rights issue, you can't question. So I interview parents, and they'll tell me they're almost all politically progressive. Okay, most of the parents that call me are politically progressive, and I interviewed almost five dozen of them now. And they'll tell me like I support LGBTQ, but I I really I'm not sure this is right for my daughter. Like I don't I don't think she's really gender dysphoric. She's getting worse. Like what is going on here? And I'll say to them, would you take away her binder? You know, binder is that compression garment they wear to flatten their breasts. And they'll say to me, oh, I can't do that. I mean, I, you know, I support LGBTQ and whatnot. And I'll say to her, you know, sometimes I'll say to them, would you give her cigarettes? Why don't you give her cigarettes? This again, ignoring the fact that at least 98% of trans folks who get trans-affirming healthcare see a marked increase in their mental health and their ability to live happily. Yet, Schreer in this book goes even further than just using the bunk science to argue what 60 Minutes is arguing. She argues that trans people are a social contagion, an epidemic sweeping our society, using dehumanizing language towards an already discriminated against minority. Throughout her book, she repeatedly misgenders trans people, again, something to be shown as harmful. And she also insults trans people who have transitioned happily and describes them as monstrous and disgusting and gross. A six feet tall, pancake makeup blurring a stubble jaw, two breasts grafted onto a muscular torso like add-ons. There was no mistaking that this lingerie specialist was male. She describes us as inhuman things, instead of actual people trying our best to live our lives. That's the language she uses here. She also illustrates stories in the book where she stalks supposed transgender workers at their place of work in order to document and insult them within her pages. Again, I've talked about this in my other video. And as I said, this book has become incredibly influential, but it's also emblematic of all the narratives that many anti-transgender groups try to weaponize against the transgender community. In the United Kingdom, transgender healthcare for trans youth was effectively blocked after two detransitioners challenged transaffirming healthcare in court after their horrific detransitions. And their lawyer, by the way, was Paul Conrath, an anti-abortion and anti-gay lawyer who has connections to the U.S. conservative hate group Alliance Defending Freedom. And as I said, this court battle was supported by numerous anti-transgender groups in the United Kingdom, including TERFs and TERF organizations like the WOLF, who I've discussed in other videos about their ideology, but basically boiled down to a dogmatic hate group intent on attacking transgender folks to the point of actually working against their own interests as mainly cisgender women by siding with anti-abortion and conservative groups like the Heritage Foundation. Even more so, these detransition narratives are the exact same stories used by Republican lawmakers in making the bills that deny trans youth health care. You know, the bills like the ones passed in Arkansas that the 60 Minute segment was initially framed as being about. Literally, the 60 Minute segment highlights the exact narrative used to fuel the very bills that the segment was supposedly about debunking. What the fuck? <laughs> By the way, these anti-transgender and hurtful groups who weaponize detransitioners' stories do so not out of an attempt to help detransitioners, but use them at their expense to try to harm transgender people. 
detransitioners are told by these groups that they've been mutilated and harmed and that they should use their anger and their pain and their hurt and their trauma against a marginalized group that they once considered themselves a part of. It's a narrative that's pushed on them that's similar to the harmful and traumatizing ex-gay movement of the 1980s to today. Detransitioner stories and the trauma that they may face is entirely valid, but they are being used and targeted by hateful groups to be weaponized and manipulated into being used for harm. And it's absolutely disgusting. Not only all of this, but remember Grace Lidinsky Smith, the girl who was the primary focus of the 60 Minutes segment on detransitioners who I kind of glossed over earlier on in the video? In her early 20s, Grace Ladinsky Smith was seriously depressed and developed gender dysphoria. She began searching for answers in transgender communities on the internet. And when I saw them being so happy and excited about doing this wonderful transformative process to really like become their true selves, it was like, have I considered that this could be my situation too? Oh yeah, so let's talk about her. So something that the 60 Minutes segment doesn't tell you is that Grace Ladinsky smith is the president of the Gender Care Consumer Advocacy Network, an organization which claims that transgender surgeries have been marketed on social media like cigarette companies used to market tobacco to children. So yeah, apparently, according to this group, trans-affirming healthcare is like literal cancer sticks. Something, by the way, that we don't even relegate even closely to the same amount as transgender healthcare, considering that you can just buy cigarettes in literally any gas station. I somehow don't think that you can pick up a transgender surgery at your local grocery store. But 60 Minutes never mentions that. It also ignores the fact that the Gender Care Consumer Advocacy Network that Grace is a president of was expressly repudiated by one of its own co-founders because it was working with groups directly trying to limit and impose greater restrictions on transgender healthcare, as well as turf groups like the WOLF and anti-trans activists like Jennifer Blylock and Julia Long. She also directly works with anti-transgender scientists like Lisa Lightman, who has used bunk science to try to push back against gender-affirming health care. I could do a whole video on Lisa Lightman's work and break it down how it's just completely bunk science, and I will do that at some point. However, Cass Aris has already done some great videos on it, and the basic idea that you need to know for this upcoming quote that I'm about to show is that Lisa's work is completely bunk, but has been used by many turf hate groups against the trans community to argue against gender-affirming care for trans people. Leninsky Smith, in her new role as president, pursued the connections with Lightman and interviewed Lightman to promote her new study. Even though Lightman's past paper was designed to prove a pre-established theory and the D-trans people she collaborated with were already firm believers in disproven and harmful theories of rapid onset gender dysphoria. D-trans activist Laura released a message of hope aimed at British trans youth now without medical care, featuring contributions by both Leninsky Smith and Callahan. This despite the fact that both Leninsky Smith and Callahan celebrated the anti-transgender Belle v. Tavis stock ruling in contradiction to previous public and private statements. And now, WOLF has confessed to coordinating legal efforts to bring the repercussions of the Bell v. Tavistock case to the United States. With numerous bills pending in different states, it's only a matter of time before the wildfire spreads back to its source. This is the woman that 60 Minutes frames their entire detransition of segment around. In a piece supposedly about highlighting the problems that transgender people have getting healthcare, the person who gets the most screen time is someone who is actively working against the transgender community, and 60 Minutes doesn't even mention her background in that. And Grace Ladinsky Smith uses every second she's given in 60 Minutes to highlight the same narratives that folks like Turfs and Abigail Schreer portray. Did this t have any part of it? A sense that men had it easier in life than <laughs> women did, and that your road might be easier if you were male. Yes. I just had this sense that if, if I could inhabit life as like a trans man, as a man, then I wouldn't feel so self-conscious. I was thinking that it would make me feel very free. <laughs> So look, this may or may not be true about Grace Lidinsky Smith reasoning for going through a transition. However, this idea that young girls and women are trying to transition to men to shake off the shackles of the patriarchy and gain male privilege is the exact idea that those like Abigail Schreer are trying to push with their narratives about the trans community. That they're harming women and stealing away our girls to make them men. Not only is this a minor problem for a small, small, small subset of detransitioners, it's being weaponized directly against the trans community over and over and over again by actively harmful anti-transgender hate groups like TERFs. 
Oppose the teaching of gender ideology in your kid's school. Not only that, but the 60 Minutes segments highlights this turf idea that social media is trying to sell transitioning and being transgender to your kids. Oh, look, it's the YouTubers. All four tell us they learned about transitioning on the internet, where there are transformation videos on YouTube, trans influencers, and forums. Yeah, I've just never been able to be me, but I can now. Because that is the exact same narrative that those like Abigail Schreier pushed to justify denying trans people healthcare overall. YouTube, Reddit, Tumblr, TikTok, and Instagram all host popular social media influencers. Today's version of Hollywood stars. Wait, does that mean I'm a Hollywood star? No one told me that! Oh my god, Newt! Did you hear? I'm a star! I'm a Hollywood star! Newt gets it. Who insists that if you feel uncomfortable in your body, you're probably trans. Many promise that if you start a course of testosterone, all of your problems will go away. So, this is what the 60 Minute segment is. It spends less than four minutes focusing on anti-transgender legislation, limiting access to transgender healthcare, and the importance of giving affirming healthcare to trans people. Less than four minutes. And the segment doesn't focus on larger issues facing transgender people as a whole, like long wait times for surgeries or the prohibitive cost of affirming care for trans people, or discrimination that we may face in healthcare from our doctors. It literally only features a single soundbite from one trans person about the help that trans affirming healthcare can bring and has brought to at least 98% of trans people who get said care. But then after that, after those brief, scant four minutes, it spends the rest of its time focusing on an issue that affects an estimated 0.4 to 2% of the trans population that has been directly weaponized against the trans community by dogmatic anti-trans hate groups while simultaneously platforming someone in this segment who is the president of an organization that directly works with these anti-trans groups while not disclosing that fact within their own reporting. But even beyond all of that, you know what really grinds my gears about this 60 minute segment? It's how it spends the last minute of this piece. When it talks about how they were worried about the harm focusing on detransition stories might cause. LGBTQ advocacy groups like GLAAD and the Human Rights Campaign are worried that highlighting the stories of detransitioners could make things worse. We're talking about a community, transgender people that are already marginalized, that are being further marginalized and victimized by elected officials, by anti-equality forces. They're being used as a political football. Not only that, they didn't even go into why the detransition stories might be harmful. Because that clip was cut off. This part of the interview was actually cut from the full segment, but posted on their YouTube channel. Um, and we wanted to keep it focused on health care and not make it a political story. I know that there's a lot of sensitivity and maybe even fear about the story that we are doing. So perhaps you can explain the worry about our story. I have a number of concerns about a story that talks about detransitioning without really focusing on the larger context of the trans experience. We also have to talk about the people who successfully transition, the vast majority of people who do. And I'm concerned about that young person who is facing stigmatization and discrimination at home and at school, and they may attempt suicide because society has told them that they're worthless. I'm concerned about a population that has already been victimized and marginalized, and how a story that is taken out of context could further victimize and marginalize this community. So are you saying that if we bring to light that there are people who detransition, that it could lead to further stigmatizing people in the community? Bringing a story to light about detransitioning without talking about the vast majority of people who positively transition would cause concern because it sends a message. We need to also elevate the positive stories of people who successfully transition. I'll be honest, it takes some gall, some gall to literally put in a bit at the end of your segment that basically says, yeah, we were worried that this narrative might be harmful. And then speak to a person who literally warns you about this and then basically go, eh, oh well, we don't give a shit. It takes even further gall to say, um, and we wanted to keep it focused on healthcare 
and not make it a political story. And then choose to not feature trans people, but then feature people in your segment who are making political moves against the trans community. Hey, guess what? That's a political statement in and of itself, who you feature when you talk about transgender health care. I'm sorry, it is a political statement, and I'm tired of people saying that it's not. I'm tired of people saying that TERFs and anti-transgender groups are non-political and just trans people existing and talking about our healthcare is a political choice. So, instead of actually acknowledging that the harm that they may cause with this piece, they pat themselves on the back saying like, oh well, we were aware that it might cause harm. And then they actively ignore the narrative that they're feeding. And by doing so, they frame the segment as making it look like it's trans people and our advocates who are the ridiculous ones. That we're the ones that are being overly worried about something. That we're the ones trying to hurt or ignore detransitioners. That we don't care about them. That we're the jerks. Furthermore, this segment implicitly says to trans people watching this that we can talk all we want about the issues facing our community or the narratives weaponized against us all we want to. But all cis folks are going to do in response to that is smile and nod and ignore us and then cut away to people who are directly harming us and giving them the final word about how to feel about trans people instead of actually listening to trans people ourselves. You know, I'll be entirely honest with you. I've gotten very heated throughout this video. I actually went into this video with the intention of just kind of being nice about it, but saying like maybe, maybe the 60 minute segment was just misinformed. That it was just, you know, a piece done like kind of blah. It was just sort of like lukewarm in terms of its representation of transgender healthcare's issues. But, and I'm saying this off the cuff, by the way, I'm, I'm even ignoring my, my script here because I'm just kind of upset because the more I researched this, the more pissed off I got because of how clearly 60 Minutes was made aware of how harmful this framing of this argument and discussion of trans healthcare could be. Even as I researched this, GLAAD, one of the top LGBTQ advocacy organizations, reached, said that they had been reached out to by 60 Minutes about this piece. They were warned in every single way about how harmful this could be. And not only did they ignore it, but they actively frames it. They actually actively, I can't even speak. They actively framed it like trans people were the jerks. That we're the ones pushing harm. And they ignore us, and they ignore our allies, and they ignore what we actually have to say about our own issues facing us, and instead focus on people who are actively harming us. It's really, really, really messed up. And I want to make clear, if this is your first video on my channel, this is not something I like to do. I like to give every benefit of the doubt. Every single benefit of the doubt. And I was so ready to come into this segment being like, 60 Minutes probably just did a lukewarm piece that was misinformed. But... They weren't misinformed. They were given every chance to understand, and they did it anyways. But what worries me most about that is, like I said, that 60 Minutes knew all of this and did it anyways. That one of the highest rated mainstream news programs was given all the tools that they could to do this right, and instead highlighted a harmful anti-trans narrative that will propagate further harm against the trans community and mainstreaming it even more to its audience. They frame their segment as being pro-transgender, trying to help a marginalized community. But they do the opposite. And it highlights to me how dangerous and mainstream these ideas against trans people are becoming. In the United Kingdom, turf narratives like the ones being put forth in this segment and their viewpoints have become the de facto viewpoint of the media and feminism. Here in the United States, more and more conservatives and Republicans are latching on to these narratives, using them to fuel the further scapegoating of the trans community in order to win votes. And so, the reason that I chose to highlight this story was again not to shit on or dunk on 60 Minutes, a lukewarm news show at best well past its importance and relevance. Instead, I did this to show you how prevalent an issue this really is, how prevalent these narratives are, how persuasive they can be when they are framed without proper facts and education about the trans community and without listening to trans people. But more importantly, I did it to show you how you can push back against these narratives. Because that's what we need to do. Push back against the idea that trans healthcare is in some way harmful, experimental, or dangerous. We need to acknowledge that trans healthcare and the beneficial effects it can have save transgender people's lives and improve our quality of life and have been well-researched, proven, and manageable. We need better infrastructure and access given to trans-affirming healthcare so those who need it can get it. And for us to better understand those who don't need it even more. But all that only comes 
with education, bettering the systems and infrastructure in place, and not limiting it, detransitioners matter and should be cared about. But so too do trans folks who are in desperate need for healthcare and support, because it saves our lives. That takes understanding and caring, not demonization, misinformation, and misrepresentation, because we've had enough of that already. That's it for this segment of 69 Minutes. Next up, Professor Katikins does a deep dive into the horrific lack of catnip in Jesse Jenner's apartment. Now, uh, how do I get out of this void? Anybody? Uh, no, like, like literally, I have, I have, I have, I have no idea how to get out of here. I'm, I'm quite scared and alone. Um, so, uh, yeah. Oh, is that John Oliver over there? Really quick, everybody, here is a video of my cat, Newt, because I totally forgot, because I went off script and got upset at the end of this video, to do my usual rigmarole. So please enjoy this video of Newt while I say the usual things. Please, uh, if you can, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. It really helps me out. But even more importantly, Patreon pays my bills. I am a full-time YouTuber, so if you want to support me doing more videos like this, please help me out on Patreon. It gets yourself cool perks. We do geeky watch-alongs every month and a bunch of extra stuff, so please go check me out over there. But beyond all of that, thank you so much for watching this, and I just wanted to make sure I got this in here, and I, I really hope that this video was helpful for a bunch of people. It's time for Pride Month and time to celebrate my Patreons. Catherine and Beth, Miranda, Janelle, Ashley Allen, Bo Kiki, Yo, Eli Bergmas, Morgan the Pirate Queen, Ashlyn Solstice, Greg Gillum, James Elizabeth, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Barbara Ruski, Samuel Howard, Felicia Toast, Alex, Boy to Mary Beth, Earl, Wellington Marcus, Stephen Schuhart, Kate, Miki Teen, Bush, April Struck, Bass, A Man Chooses, A Slave Obeys, Corian Vale Honkinen, James Krivda, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, Buttoneer, Jessica Wright, Jared Johnson, Peter Landers, Ferengito, John Steele, Carmen Olson, Meadow Whisperer, William Stewart, Maggie the Goblin, Ulysses the Pagan, Melinda Walters, Joy A, Alex Owen, Barbara Helchuk, Heresis the Auth 13, Jason Knott, John Weatherby, Celestial Dawn, Lamia, Sky Skinner, Andrew K, Maeve, Nathan Steele, Sean Piper, Tiffany Danger, Flynn, Troy Stull, Sky Dodo, Amanda Comet, Ava Canivia, Geek Filter, Janie Peckard, Polymena Din, Laura Demero, Marina Carr, Gretchen Badger, Ellie O'Dare, Sarah Bystam, W. Randy E. D. Jacob Tovar, Strawberry Pop Tart, Keith Briggs, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Lysa, Mountain Harpy, Jessica Chapman, Andrew Lamoro, Sarah Sweeney, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Emily Loomis, Mari Mack, Zone One Librarian, Burr, Jenny Mabel, Michael Hardy, Pasty, Michael Goaty, Philip Hawkins, Andy H. You're the best. I love all of you. You're freaking amazing. Thank you so much for making this possible. Happy Pride, everybody.